Imperial Yeast is at it again with their Imperialis project, creating yet another unique proprietary strain through the hybridization of two other yeasts. In addition to its excellent attenuation and rapid reduction of diacetyl, I-10 Mangostini contributes robust, ripe, tropical fruit, strawberry, and lychee notes to beer that complement modern hops. And as a Kvike hybrid, it can be fermented anywhere from 78 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 26 to 32 degrees Celsius, without issue. Head over to imperialyeast.com to learn more about I-10 Mangostini and be sure to pick some up for your next batch of Fruity IPA. Sometime in the last decade, give or take a few years, sour beers became a rather hot topic among craft beer nerds and brewers. Once viewed as a sort of niche segment, we started seeing sour beers landing on tap lists all over the country, with some breweries like the Rare Barrel and the Brewery focusing almost solely on this tart and tasty category. However, many avoided brewing these styles for various reasons, seemingly the most common being that they took way too long to make, often over a year. As sour beers continued to grow in popularity, approaches were developed to reduce this turnaround time, making them much more approachable for the typical brewer. You are listening to the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott, and joining me on this episode to discuss our experiences brewing sour beer using modern quick methods is contributor Jordan Folks. You know, it's funny you mentioned the how popular they are. You know, they really exploded in popularity. Oh, man. It's almost like up there with hazy IPAs at this point, the quick sour stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting too. And if you look uh, there, there's been kind of this, in my opinion, this kind of melding of the whole uh, hazy IPA with the sour thing with the sour slushy, you know, um, whatever you want to call it. There's a nice tartness that people are starting to realize, Hey, this even works with hoppy beers. I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. And then there's this whole debate of, is it a sour beer? Is it a kettle sour? What should we label it as? Plenty to talk about today. (laughs) Absolutely. And after we talked about our experiences with traditional sour beer brewing methods back on episode 273, which I believe dropped in February of 2023, I knew we were going to get emails asking us to cover more modern souring techniques. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, My my inbox was blasted, as it were. Uh, Whereas I've only made a few traditionally soured beers, uh, beers, I have quite a bit more experience with quick souring methods and look forward to chatting about it with you today, Jordan. All right. If you're a fan of this show and you'd like to receive a reward for your support, consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. By making a small monthly pledge, you'll receive rewards like access to unpublished contributor recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com and an invitation to a monthly live Q&A session with somebody in the brewing world. This month's guest is Brewlosophy's resident weird beer brewer, the dude who comes up with beer names that are just as clever as his recipes, Steve Thanos who has been a contributor for over three years now. In addition to his role with Brewlosophy, Steve has served uh, in leadership for his local club, the Plainfield Ale and Lager Enthusiasts, also known as Pale, uh, and has many, many batches under his belt. To be a part of this session, you have to make your pledge of just $3 or more at patreon.com slash brewlosophy no later than Friday, June 23rd, 2023, as Steve's going to be taking questions that Saturday the 24th. All past sessions are available on our private Patreon and Facebook pages, so you can go back and watch them whenever you like. Learn more about becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Another really easy way to support us is by using the links found at brewlosophy.com slash support. When you're shopping online, your experience won't change at all, and we get a little kickback for the referral. And finally, if you wouldn't mind letting us know what you think about this show by leaving a rating and review in Apple Podcasts or wherever it is you listen to podcasts, we really would appreciate that. Uh, Huge cheers to everybody who's already taken the time to rate and review the show. We read every single one of those reviews. Feedback is brought to you by Claw Hammer Supply, who are known for their incredible all-in-one electric brewing systems. I've brewed on both their 120 and 240 volt systems, and I'm telling you, these things are legit, efficient, easy to use with a relatively small footprint. You will not be disappointed with one of these units. Plus, the guys behind the company run a really great YouTube channel, which you can find by searching YouTube for Claw Hammer Supply. If you're in the market for electric brewing gear, make sure to check out what Claw Hammer Supply has to offer at clawhammersupply.com. And don't forget to let them know Brewlosophy sent you when you're checking out. That's clawhammersupply.com. Dot com. Listener Andreas Nukel, I believe is how you say it, wrote in with feedback on episode 281 where we talked about open fermentation. Andreas said, when you talk about open fermentation, you have to talk about Schneiderweiss. Schneiderweiss still uses open fermentation, even though it's much more expensive. Uh, and when you talk to Hans Peter Drexler, the former master brewer of Schneiderweiss, he says it's one of the main reasons they have the best wheat beer. With open fermentation, the yeast gets a lot more oxygen and there's no pressure, so the aromas can develop much better. 
In addition, the Kreuzen is skimmed off at Schneider Weiss. Hans-Peter Drexler says that you should taste the Kreuzen, then ask yourself if you want that in your beer. Well, that makes uh, a lot of sense to me because <laughs> Schneider is truly the best German wheat beer. Uh, I actually was lucky enough to visit uh, in person one time and got a brewery tour. And uh, it's an incredible facility, an incredible space. And dear God, their wheat beer is so freaking good. It, I, so I've had Schneider Weiss. Uh, it's like a Hefeweizen. I guess we can call it that uh, as well many times. And I think it's a fantastic version of the uh, or example of the style. Um, and, I, you know, I... <laughs> I don't know to what extent. This is the thing with with specific variables like open fermentation. We we have as humans, we have this propensity to want to believe that everything that we do matters, right? And so if we employ something like open fermentation, that's just one one variable on the entire gestalt. You do that and the beer ends up coming out great. It's easy to look and say, well, that thing that I did is the reason it came out great when it could be so many different other things. So the reason I say that, I'm just not entirely convinced yet that the open, open fermentation is why Schneider Weiss has great beer. May it be a part of the reason why? Absolutely. But I agree. Schneider Weiss is probably one of my favorite, you know, uh, Bavarian Weiss beers out there. I think it's a fantastic uh, example of the style. Uh, I, I'm still curious to learn more about what open fermentation actually does. And and I've started to question, uh, you know, with with this variable in particular, Jordan, I'm curious your thoughts on this. What extent, you know, volume, you know, volume matters. So, might there be a difference in a you know twenty barrel batch versus a five gallon or nineteen liter batch? I think that might be the case with stuff like open fermentation because you've got all these different you know pressures and such going on. Um, we still have yet to do an experiment uh, on open fermentation in a vice beer, so I appreciate uh, I appreciate that that uh, recommendation. I think we should get to that sooner than later. But do you think volume might might be an issue here? That's an interesting one because I heard someone on a podcast somewhere, maybe a German brewer even, talking about volume. And uh, they said that they found that they were getting a better beer when they only half filled the tank. Uh, so that there was some sort of effect there. Uh, but obviously with Weiss beer, those, the Kreuzen is just so massive. That right. There's a bit of a logistical <laughs> advantage to having a larger vessel than necessary. But this is a pretty common approach for Weiss beer. I think that in terms of open fermentation, Saison and Weiss beer are two of the ones that you hear the most. Uh, and then, and I believe that uh, it, it kind of helps promote ester development. So, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're given Schneider's, uh, incredible beer quality. I, I think this is certainly worth investigating to see if they're uh, they're onto something there. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And uh, about tasting the Kreuzen, I, I I've I would never. <laughs> I've tasted Kreuzen many times. It's always nasty. So, but so is yeast. I mean, if you it, it doesn't taste good, but your beer doesn't taste like the yeast necessarily. It also it also doesn't taste like the Kreuzen. But skimming it off, I mean, may, we've done experiments on that. I'm not sure it had an impact, but hey, you do you. If if, if that's what you think is contributing to the best beer in the world, then keep doing it. So thank. Thank you for the feedback, Andreas. If you have show feedback, you could send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com or drop us a note on social media. If you're not already subscribed to The Brewlosophy Show on YouTube, go do it now at youtube.com slash at The Brewlosophy Show. That's the at symbol followed by The Brewlosophy Show. Martin is producing some seriously awesome content over there, and we're certain fans of this podcast will love it just as much. Time for a quick break. We, uh, When we return, we're going to be discussing our experiences with modern quick souring methods. Chilling work can be a chore, especially after a long brew day, but not with the Exchillerator Counterflow Chiller, which can chill a 5-gallon or 19-liter batch of wort in 5 minutes or less, leading to a strong cold break and clearer wort in the fermenter. Brewlosophy's Matt Del Fiaco uses the Exchillerator Max and absolutely loves it. In addition to improved chilling efficiency, every Exchillerator comes with a 5-year warranty that covers the entire chiller for manufacturer defects. If you're looking to up your chilling game and a CFC is right for you, head over to Exchillerator.com today. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to yakimavalleyhops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. 
There's no denying that stainless steel is the best material for brewing equipment, and Delta Brewing Systems offers some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which in addition to holding 8 gallons or 30 liters of work comes with a domed lid to even further reduce the chances of a messy blow-off, plus it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure for closed transfers. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brewing systems out there, and their prices are shockingly low. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear that won't break the bank, do yourself a favor and head over to DeltaBrewingSystems.com today. I have to imagine that for many, perhaps even most brewers, their first sour beer was an unfortunate accident caused by an unknown bacteria that somehow got into their beer and spoiled it. Thankfully, that is not uh, the only way to produce sour beer these days. While sour beers traditionally took a long time to produce, a handful of approaches have been developed to significantly reduce the overall turnaround time. And as lovers of sour beers, both Jordan and I have experiences using most of these methods. Now, to keep things somewhat organized and on track, we're going to start by discussing our experiences with various quick souring methods before shifting our focus to the myriad souring microbes there are available to brewers these days. And I mean, there are a bunch, which I think is phenomenal. Uh, all right, Jordan, let's establish a bit of a baseline by explaining what exactly we mean by quick souring methods. Yeah. I mean, I think basically it's making a beer sour in a few days, be it one day, maybe up to a week, as opposed to uh, you know, the year long plus process that a traditional mixed fermentation can take. And so I think that right there, mixed fermentation is a key delineation here is we are typically, uh, acidifying prior to fermentation as opposed to after or uh, co-ferment, uh, you know, co-acidification and co-ferment at the same time. Yeah. In, in that last episode, experience episode on traditional souring methods, we, we hit on this quite a bit, but I think the typical approach is you produce your wort just like you would for any other beer, and then you co-pitch, you know, a blend of bacteria and yeast, and that yeast might be Saccharomyces blended with Brettanomyces. I think usually it is. Um, it could just be a sac strain as well, but there's that co-pitch, and then you just let it sit for a long time to do its thing to work until it reaches that desirable characteristic. For me, that took well over a year uh, on the sour beers that I brewed traditionally. I think I've made three or four in total, uh, and and that was just too long. You had to find a place to store it. You know, for me, that was a shower that we very rarely used, uh, and, and it 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 was just kind of a, a detractor for me. It made it was a, a barrier for me to want to keep brewing sour beers. So when these quick souring methods came around, which I kind of define like you do it just just sour beers that take about the same amount of time as any other beer to brew um when they came around i was very interested though of course there was a lot of talk right about how well you're not going to get the complexity it's not going to be as good which we know is completely subjective um and i do think there are i mean I'm pretty certain there are some truths to the fact that quick souring is going to produce a perceptibly different sour characteristic uh, than than if you were to go the more traditional route. But on many levels, that can be, in my opinion, a pretty positive thing. Yeah, I mean, different strokes for different folks, right? I mean, exactly. Different. They're they're different, and there's a big debate in the industry or nerds on the internet about uh, is this sour beer and does this count? And uh, it's not that one's better th than the other. They're just different. They're just and, different. Yeah. You know, you know, you're not, you can on a hot summer day with like a fruited Berliner Weisse, you can chug it from the can like you could a Coors Light. You can't do that with a Cantillon, you know, goose. And so <laughs> there is a bit of a drinkability that it offers that that's a bit of a trade-off for complexity, ostensibly. And that's okay. Different different beers for different times. Well, let, so let's talk a little bit before we get into the different methods about the the, the pros and the cons of, of quick souring as compared, you know, to traditional souring. For me, I think the biggest thing that I experienced in all of the quick sour beers that I've made, um, all, many of which have been kind of Berliner Weiss uh, style, you know, kind of inspired by we'll say uh, is that the the they're not as complex. You know, you're not co-pitching. You're not letting these multiple microbes do their work together. Really, you're focusing on developing lactic acid, which which provides that acidity, that tartness. Uh, and that is a fairly unidimensional. I, I don't want people to fight me on that. I know there are different characteristics from different lactose strains, all that stuff. But it is a fairly, you know, single dimensional uh, um, acidity in my experience. And then you're getting on, you know, after you get that, you're throwing whatever yeast you want, you know, 
know, to, to finish fermenting that beer and you get the characteristics from that yeast, whether that be, you know, the, the flagship, the Chico strain, or you could go with something English. I've done that before. You go with a, a, a Hefeweizen strain. Uh, you've got all the options in the world, but that's really where you're getting this, uh, this complexity. And, and to me, the way I look at it is almost like, you know, a traditionally made, say, Flemish red ale is going to be its own thing. It's it's this combination where everything is blended together and it creates this gestalt that is just wow. Whereas the beauty of a quick sour one is you've got these two things that are kind of overlapping each other uh, and it creates its own version of wow that is just wholly different than what a traditional sour tastes like. Well, and, you know, there's chemistry to explain this, right? Flemish r- reds have a notable amount of acetic acid. Uh, vinegar, right? And and again, it detracts from its drinkability. It's more of a sipper. Uh, it, kettle souring, when done correctly, <laughs> should not be creating any acetic acid. Right. And so you don't have that vinegar bite. Um, there's other, uh, you know, chemical compounds that are present, like spontaneously fermented beer. Um, there's just more things going on. And so you're, you know, I don't think anyone needs to fight you over the fact that it is simpler yeah. and it's nice in that regard for a simple drink sometimes. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I remember uh, the first time I had a, a, a beer that I knew was kettle soured and uh, it, it, Matt from sour beer blog. Uh, he was, he was just getting his, um, he was starting his uh, brewery. I forget exactly what they're called over out in uh, Washington, D.C., I believe. That was going to be a sour beer you know, or, or is a sour beer focused brewery. And he had a bunch on tap at HomebrewCon. This was back in 2016 or 17. And I was blown away at how delicious these quick sour beers were. I thought, you know, they, that they were just traditionally made American sour beers. And uh, when he explained to me that they were made like three weeks prior, I was just, I couldn't believe it. Um, and so there are, you know, there are tricks that you can do to really kind of up that complexity and kind of bring it closer to a more traditional flavor. But I think, I think we just have to be open <laughs> in saying that, you, you know, using quick sour methods, you are not going to produce the that that gestalt that is a you know one and a half year long oak aged Flemish red or Eau Brune or something like that. They're just going to be different, and that's okay. Yeah, I think that you're referencing uh, Doctor Lambic, uh, who I believe the brewery is called Mellow Mink, and I think it's in like ruralish Pennsylvania. And oh my gosh, I got so much information from him back in the day. Uh, <laughs> really incredible uh, kind of early sour internet source of information. Yes. In fact, I recall hearing that when he opened that brewery with the intention of um, having barrel age, you know, bottle conditioned sours, he actually had to start pumping out kettle sours just to have something on tap to serve customers <laughs> yeah. as the barrels, you know, eventually started to age. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the correction. He is based out of Pennsylvania. You're right. Uh, and they're called Mellow Mink Brewing. Phenomenal sour beers though. And the ones that I had... I'm not sure if they, when I'm the, the time that I'm referencing where I tried their beers, if they had any traditionally soured beers on tap. I just remember Matt telling me, yeah, this was made like a month ago. We made it just for, you know, HomebrewCon, and I, I could not believe it. I was floored. So the fact that you can produce something that was that enjoyable and their line, I mean, they had probably had the longest line at, at HomebrewCon in the expo uh, the year that I was there because they had what, five or six sour beers. They were all the rage at the time. And it was just really fun to talk to them about how they produce these beers. Now, most people who are making kettle sours and in, at least in my experience, Jordan, maybe it's different for you. The people who are making these quick sours also have experience and totally value the traditional approach as well. So it's not like you're only going to do one or the other uh, unless you're really impatient like me. It's just that again, we're going to belabor this point. It's just that they produce different characteristics and a, a nice quick turnaround sour beer can be absolutely delicious. Yeah, I mean, at this point, I think there probably are a lot of people that have never done the the long term stuff just because sure, it's so yeah. easy and there's so many cultures out there. But I think another interesting thing about the complexity argument is fruiting. Is that when we're making a kettle sour beer, we're also typically using, um, you know, organ fruit puree, and that stuff is great and it works and it's really nice and clean. But it lacks the complexity of a re fermentation on raw fruit from like the farmers market or something like that. And so I think there's a bit of a confounding variable there, which is the simplicity. Of the fruit that's typically employed in a, a kettle sour beer. So you can up the complexity if you age that kettle sour beer on some real fruit. 
Absolutely. Uh, and that, that brings me to another point, And then we're going to move into these methods uh, about one of the things that I love about quick souring methods is I don't feel terrible if I do something to it that might mess it up a little bit or maybe take it away from where it was. There are a lot of times where I've made, you know, kettle sour wheat beer or something like that, where before I, you know, I'm planning on adding berries to it or, or peaches or some fruit. I taste it. And I'm like, dang, this is good all on its own. If I had spent a year and a half doing that, I really would be afraid to be like, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to move forward with this fruit edition that I planned a year and a half ago, because what if it ruins it? And then if you feel like you just wasted a year and a half of your time, you know, building this thing and it didn't turn out as good as you like, you do a quick sour that it, it's like any other beer, you know, you, you may not like it as much, but Hey, it only took you two and a half, three weeks to make. So there are a lot of benefits in my opinion to doing it. I think the biggest con we've already hit on it is that, that, you know, you're, you're maybe going to get this, uh, kind of basic uh, lactic acidity that that is different than the the pediococcus acetyl, you know acetobacter mixed with lab uh, type of tartness that you get in a more traditionally soured beer the other thing is if you let it go too long and and it doesn't take very long at all you could you could create a beer that is just undrinkably tart oh gosh and that's the problem with a lot of these kettle sour beers yes yeah I you know it now there are some ways to counteract that like um, you know like the smoothie sour they're adding fruit puree into the keg or the yeah. bright tank or whatever and not fermenting it out. And so there's some uh, unfermented sugar to balance that out. You know, soda, Coca-Cola, whatever, I think the pH is below three. And so it doesn't drink acidic, you know, on your palate. No. Uh, so the addition of unfermented sugars can definitely rebalance that. But good Lord, you know, some of these <laughs> sour beers, it's like you got to go to the dentist after you have a drink. <laughs> yeah, your tongue gets all sore. I know, I've, I've been there too. So throughout, uh, the, the so far, we've been using the term kettle sour a lot. And I, I want to point out, that is kind of a colloquial term for quick sour beers. Would you agree with me, Jordan, that a lot of people just refer to quick souring as kettle souring? Yes, despite the fact that the kettle may or may not be involved in the souring process. Exactly. So we're going to move into talking about the different quick souring methods, one of which is kettle souring, but we're going to try to break it down into the different forms of quick souring that do exist. The first the first time I ever heard of a being able to make a sour beer that doesn't take a year, you know, long to make, uh, it was a buddy of mine, Chris, who had told me about trying this approach that he'd heard about, you know, a couple of years prior called Sour Mash. Now, if, if you are into distilling or if you watch any of the fun shows on the History Channel about distilling, you have no doubt heard the term Sour Mash. It is it, one way that distillers produce some of my favorite types of American whiskeys. Uh, now, in the brewing world, when we're talking about a sour mash, basically what we're referring to is, is that you, you mash your grains like usual, and then you close up that mash tun and you leave it alone. <laughs> it sounds like you're, you're, like, like you're just like a recipe for disaster, in my opinion, but you leave that alone. Whatever lactic acid bacteria is in there is going to kind of do its thing. I've heard of some people tossing in you know a handful of uh, unmilled grain because we know that there's there's lactic acid bacteria on those grains, but then you leave it alone and you can draw off little samples of wort from your valve uh, until it reaches a level of acidity that you like, and then you just proceed like normal. Um, I've never done this. I have a friend who did it, uh, uh, and and he, he actually did it multiple times, and none of his beers turned out that well, so there's a reason I haven't done it. Uh, I, I do feel like I should try it at some point, but have you ever tried a sour mash? Yeah, I did it once. Um, and there, there is an ideal temperature range. Um, so typically what people will do is they'll mash out to kind of like sterilize it ostensibly. And then yeah. you want to drop that to like 113 to 120 F that's 45 to 49 C and then hold it there for a half day to three days. And until you dial in that acidity, um, it's kind of tough to taste the acidity kind of referencing back to what I just said, because with this residual sweetness still in solution, it hasn't been fermented. Um, it's really difficult to, for me at least to, to taste that. So a pH meter is definitely your friend here because you don't want it to go too far. Um, but then after that you, uh, move on to, to boiling. So typically people want to try to mitigate oxygen exposure. Um, there, and the other thing here is you don't want any non-lactic acid bacteria to take hold. Uh, that can lead to things like butyric acid or isovaleric Ugh. acid, which yeah. are absolutely disgusting uh, off flavors. And so this is one of those methods that's not that common because the off flavor risk is is fairly significant. But um, I believe uh, Cade's Old Brewery Blue Owl is exclusively sour mash. And so clearly, you know, there are professional examples that are making fantastic beers using this method, but I don't think it's super common because the lab stuff is so easy. 
crazy, the cultures. But the one time I did it, um, it worked and it made a, a, a good sour beer. And a fun little story out of that is I actually kept some of the grains and dried them out and uh, used them subsequently as acid malt. Oh, cool. That, that's really cool. Because I think most acid malt, they just spray lactic acid over the top of you know pale malt or whatever. But you actually made basically sour malts, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and I think that I must have not milled the grains or something when I did that that time. Um, and they were definitely weaker than store bought acid malt, sure. but they, they did work. Oh, that's pretty rad. You know, as as we were talking about this, I was reminded of the one sour mash that I did try. It was sort of an offshoot. That's kind of why I forgot about it. So I have one of those small like cube ice chests. I bought it when we had a boat. You know, you can load up six, seven sodas in there and take it out on the boat. And it, pretty small. Well, I thought I got an itch one day and I thought, you know what? I'm going to match. I'm going to, I'm going to do a, try this sour mash thing. I put like a brew in a bag bag in there, put the grains in, uh, did my normal mash. And then I just left it in my hot garage over the summer. And I, for that one, I did toss in a handful of unmilled. I think it was Pilsner malt. Uh, and I, and it just kind of hung around at about a hundred degrees Fahrenheit. It gets really hot where I live in the summer. Uh, for, I think it was like four days and I tested the pH. It was down around 3.8. Um, that, I think that was about it. Yeah, 3.8 or so. And then uh, that took like three, four days. Collected that wort, boiled it as usual, and then added just a tiny amount of hops during the boil. I did all of this like inside on my stove because it was such a small batch. Uh, and then I fermented it with flagship or an equivalent. Um, and, it, you know, the beer wasn't bad, actually. It, it smelled worse in the <laughs> in the mash tun <laughs> than it did in the boil kettle. And the beer tasted far better Um than I thought it was going to, but I still didn't like it that much. I don't know how else to say that. It wasn't, it didn't have the the lactic acid tartness that I prefer. It was very, it was more subtle and it had kind of a doughy flavor that I that I haven't gotten when I've done other quick souring methods. Uh, like I said, a buddy of mine tried sour mashing a few times and he's just never had any success at all. So your mileage may vary with this approach. Um, if you're gonna try it, I would suggest if you have uh, like a brew in a bag or something like that, it's a lot easier to to pull those, you know, spent grains out of the mash tun and leave that wort in there, especially if you're doing it in a kettle uh, by chance. Uh, you can pull that out and then just go go ahead and proceed with your brew day. But uh, but yeah, sour mashing. It's a. It, it, I don't feel like it's nearly as popular or popularly talked about at least as it was like ten years ago. Yeah, it kind of feels like it's dying, you know, thanks to big yeast labs out there <laughs> giving us all <laughs> yeah. these incredible various lacto strains uh, and even, you know, some other non-lacto strains, which we'll talk about, that can uh, easily sour without maybe some of the risks and hassles associated with sour mashing. Absolutely. So I, I think th- we, we've already used the term a gazillion times in this episode, kettle souring. Let's move on to talking about this. It has some unique uh, uh, aspects to it that differ quite a bit from sour mashing, but I feel like this is the approach that really has defined where we're at with American sour beers, uh, at least on the homebrew scale. I think a lot of breweries, breweries, uh, you know, commercial breweries are also relying on on various kettle souring methods, these quick souring methods. Uh, you have quite a bit of experience with souring in general, and I'm assuming that includes multiple kettle soured beers. Well, uh, as we'll talk about in the next little section, maybe not. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, so I think the, the basic process here is that you uh, mash as normal, uh, and then you're separating the sweet wort from the grains, and then it goes into the kettle, uh, at which point it's boiled off for you know five minutes or something to kill off any residual microbes, which as we discussed in the last little bit, could cause some off flavors if uh, yep. they were to take over from the lab. That's why we boil. Um, and then we go ahead and hold it at like 100 degrees Fahrenheit and um, add some lactic acid uh, bacteria like... Uh, lactoplantarum or something and then you hold that for like a day or, or more depending on um, how aggressive your culture is and you get some sour wort but there's a couple keys there is one is the ability to hold it hot and then two is you know you don't want to add any hops because these strains tend to be so hop uh, intolerant and w- the hops will mitigate the souring. And so, but you don't actually have to boil it, right? And you could ostensibly, there are some strains that can handle a couple IBUs. And so there's a v- various ways to go about it. But I think the key here is that you're holding it hot in a kettle. Um, and th- that is why it's really popular in the commercial setting is they have the kettle. And then that's a good way that they can uh, keep it hot without having to move it around. And the other key there is that they're not infecting their cold side equipment because it never leaves the kettle. And so while it gets you know acidic and has this like thriving lacto 
in solution, they can kill it in the same vessel from which it came. So it's really mitigating any risk in the brew house. Absolutely. And I think when you look at this approach of kettle souring, the the two big things that appeal to most brewers, whether commercial or at home, is that you're getting your acidity in as little as I mean, I, I had a buddy who made a kettle sour that was delicious and he only soured it with with good belly for 12 hours. I mean, it, it just it sours so fast. And that is hugely a function, not just of the lactic acid bacteria being used, but of the ability to hold that wort at about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which I believe is a 37, 38 C. That that souring, the, you know, everything works faster at, 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 in warmer environments. Mm-hmm. We know that chemical reactions occur uh, faster at warmer environments, and so the ability to hold that wort so warm allows that lactic acid bacteria to do its thing. And remember, you're you don't have any yeast in there yet, so you don't have to worry about fusel alcohols or overesterification or anything like that because there's no yeast in there. Once it's sour, now you've got your wort. It's just a little bit more tart than it was before, and then you proceed like normal. Normal. Obviously, the the decisions that you make recipe wise are going to be based on the style that you're going for. But you can do this with any style. I've had a a kettle soured IPA that was phenomenal. Uh, it's just a matter of preference, and I think <laughs> talking about the whole art science thing, that's kind of the artistic thing. And 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 this whole kettle souring uh, uh, approach has really opened up a lot of avenues, I think, for exploration and experimentation for a lot of brewers. Is it going to create a traditional soured beer? Of course not. We've already talked about that. But when you do this approach, it's pretty easy to control the acidity level. All you have to do is taste it. And as soon as it's as, as acidic as you want it, you bring it's in the kettle. You just turn your kettle back on, light up your fire, uh, and, and bring it back up to a boil. You kill off that lactic acid as bacteria. It's not going to sour the wort anymore. You boil it, you add your hops, you ferment it. It's very, very easy. Uh, this, to me, was one of, when I learned about this approach, super duper eye-opening. Um, and and again, I you know I, I didn't do this until I'd tried multiple uh, kettle soured beers that other people had brewed. And I, it, it just worked out, seemed to work out so well uh, that, I, that, yeah, I loved it. I, I adopted it as my go-to souring method. Yeah, and a couple of the precautions that people often take is reducing the pH uh, following the little mini boil to like, I think four or five or something like that. And that's mitigating. um, That's an environment that's like conducive for the lacto lacto to take off, but maybe not some of the things that we don't want. Um, And then also a CO2 blanket is pretty common. There are fears that um, oxygen exposure can make a uh, disgusting sour beer. And so those are kind of two things you want to monitor, but you know, at the homebrew level, with these electric brewing systems, it's a perfect device. It's right? phenomenal. Yeah. You can, you can set it at a hundred degrees Fahrenheit or 95 or whatever the, uh, culture recommends. Um, milk, the funk is a great resource for that. Um, if you're using a probiotic, uh, or if you're using a lab sourced bacteria, like bootleg biology, et cetera, uh, their website will list a ideal, uh, range. You can just type that in and then, uh, maybe put like a, uh, sanitized saran wrap on top of the uh, liquid. Um, If you're really, you know, have the availability, you know, put some CO2 on there um, and kind of blanket that. Uh, Pro brewers will actually like continuously pump CO2 overnight during this process. Um, You just want to try to keep all the oxygen out. And then in a day or two, you have a a sour beer. And so the key is not getting too sour. And that's why you really got to monitor it. Yeah. And, and to me, the monitoring is kind of fun because you're like, oh, wow, it's only been eight hours and I've already got this acidity. You know, I'm, I can taste it. Uh, one thing uh, to note about the CO2 blanket or covering the, the wort um, while it's souring with saran wrap. That's how I've done it in the past. We did do an experiment comparing a kettle soured beer that was, um, you know, had the that was CO2 blanketed and one that was open that didn't have the CO2 blanket that was exposed to oxygen. And uh, Jason Cipriani did that experiment. If I if I recall correctly his comment was that during the souring process the the one that didn't have the co2 blanket did smell kind of icky like cheesy i guess uh but once he boiled it he said during the boil it was like the that was the worst part of it (laughs) the smell wise that once he boiled it fermented it out and served them next to each other he could he couldn't tell them apart so there's a little bit of debate as to whether or not that's necessary the way i view it is it's so easy to just throw some saran wrap over the top of your wort or at least keep your lid on your kettle that you you know you might as well avert the risk and and just do it but uh there is like i said there is some debate on that now 
the typical method that I use specifically because I have the, uh, the, I will say the luxury of a, uh, electric brewing system that I can hold at a spe- specifically set, uh, temperature for a long time, for however long I need to. Uh, the, the method that I use though is uh, brew in a bag. That way I can just remove the grains from that kettle, um, and use a single kettle for the entire, you know, uh, mash and then souring part. So I'll do the mash. I remove the grains. Uh, I bring that wort up to a boil for about five minutes, reduce it back down, chill that wort back down to about hundred degrees Fahrenheit or 38 C toss in whatever bacteria I'm using for souring. And then I just set my controller to hundred degrees Fahrenheit. It's pretty rad. And then I'll let it sit for 24 hours up to 36 to 48. You know, there are certain approaches we're going to talk about this later, uh, or certain sources of lactic acid bacteria that do seem to take longer than other sources. And so just based on what I'm using, I'll keep testing the pH as well as tasting uh, that wort. And when it's ready, you you just boil it and, and go on from there. It is a really, really easy approach, particularly for those of us who have access to electric brewing systems. Now, Jordan and I got in a little bit of a chat prior to recording this episode about, uh, you know, this other thing that I'm referring to is batch souring. That was a term that a a local buddy of mine used back in the day. Um, For people who don't have electric brewing systems, we're still going to refer to it colloquially as kettle souring. But holding a kettle of wort at 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 38 C for upwards of two days can be very difficult to do. Especially if you're using propane, you know, that stuff burns hot at the bottom of your kettle. That stuff Don't burns do that. hot. <laughs> Don't do that, right? It's a very, very difficult thing to do. So there are some options that that people who want to make sours but may not be into the electric brewing system thing uh, can do that basically emulates the approach we just talked about That that is technical kettle souring. Uh, and it involves basically doing the same thing. You mash your, your grains, you, you collect your wort, but you collect it in a fermentation vessel put that vessel into a fermentation chamber that you have regulated to about 38 C or hundred F. And then you add your lactic acid bacteria there, proceed as usual, do your sampling, taste it. When it's ready, you have to rack it back out of that vessel into a boil kettle. Though, like you mentioned, Jordan, you could skip the boil altogether, but I just think it's this, the safest bet if you don't want to have enamel peeling sour beer uh, is to kill off that lactic acid bacteria, which also gives you, again, that's another knob of control. Uh, it gives you that ability to, to, to better adjust the level of acidity in the finished beer. But this, this approach referred to as batch souring, again, just a different form of kettle souring, I think is a really easy way for people who don't have electric brewing systems to get into sour beer making. Well, it's funny. I have an electric brewing system and I've never done it in the kettle. I always really? transfer. I always transfer into a keg because I'm worried about the ox- the risk of oxygen ruining the sour beer. So I will always go into a keg um, and then actually uh, purge, you know, a purge keg uh, that, that I then keep CO2 on the gas impost during the souring phase with like a, uh, a heat wrap with a, uh, you know, a Tim Johnson or, you know, Inkbird Tim controller on it. Um, and then that way I'm totally sure that I'm, you know, mitigating basically all oxygen whatsoever with this constant CO2 uh, pressure applied. And then I just, and I actually uh, CO2 push it back into the kettle to boil it. Okay. Uh, Kegs are so helpful for things like that (laughs) with all the transfers and pressure transferring and all of Mm -hmm. that. I would love, I would love, especially for somebody like you who I know has a a real heart for sour beer in general. I would love for for you to do a repeat experiment on the impact, you know, exposure to oxygen has during the souring phase on a sour beer. Cause I'm, I'm terrified of it as well. And I still, whenever I make a kettle sour, I'm still covering the top of the wort with plastic wrap. Um, I don't go to the extent of, of souring in a keg or anything. Uh, but I definitely, you know, it's one of those things where one data point has not yet convinced me that I don't need to be mindful of it, but I want to see more, you know, it's kind of an interesting variable. Uh, but, but ultimately of those three, uh, uh approaches that we talked about, two of which are basically the same. Um, do, are there specific styles that you would say work better with, you know, one approach sour mashing over say kettle souring? Gosh, I don't know. I, I think that there are different ways to get to a similar endpoint. Um, I would say that 
broadly speaking, these methods are not going to make a uh, lambic tasting lambic style. No, you know, it just doesn't have <laughs> the Brett complexity, the PDO, and other microbes from a spontaneous fermentation, um, or kind of like an American sour beer uh, that's using a mixed fermentation, or like a, a Flanders Red that's notable uh, for its acetic character. You're not going to get that. So I think that. Um, Berliner Weisse is a really great example of a style that works well for this. But I would say that between batch souring, kettle souring, uh, and um, the the sour mash, I think effectively they're all going to be fairly interchangeable. But, you know, Marshall, there's actually two more approaches we didn't mention that we should probably mention here at the end here. Let's Um, do it. Uh, one, uh, which is the ultimate, uh, cheat is just adding lactic acid. (laughs) Yeah, you're right. I I left that off the list. You're right. (laughs) But there are, there are breweries, which I would say are suspect that are making sour beers by simply adding a crap ton of lactic acid, uh, to the finished beer. And so there, I, I, there are probably people out there that can argue that you can make a decent sour beer that way. Maybe if you had enough fruit puree, you can. Um, <laughs> but that is about as easy as it gets, right? Is just yeah. adding enough lactic acid. Uh, and maybe phosphoric or citric or something would also work. Um, but I think lactic's common. Um, and the other one are these new novel souring yeast strains. Oh, um, yeah. Like Sour Vissier and um, Philly Sour. Philly Sour, yeah. And uh, like, I think Sour Vissier is a Saccharomyces type. Uh, strain, but I think Philly sour is something totally different, like La Plentia or some one. Uh, but but the the in addition to creating ethanol, these yeast strains actually create uh, uh, acid. I, I guess lactic acid. I don't know what type of acid they're creating. Um, as opposed to lactic acid bacteria, it's not a yeast, uh, and it, in theory should not really be fermenting much and making much ethanol. It's only converting those starches into lactic acid. Um, so there are a couple other approaches. And those are going to have, I think, uh, even more of a nuanced flavor relative to the three styles that we just created. And uh, I say nuanced, maybe I should say different. You know, just adding straight lactic acid, that's going to be pretty <laughs> darn simple. Um, yeah. And I, I would not recommend that. Yeah, so I've done it before, uh, not on a whole batch. The, the nice thing about uh, that approach is you can at least try it out on your own if you have any lactic acid uh, in your brewery, which I think most brewers these days probably do uh, for pH adjustment. Honestly, pour yourself a glass of Kolsch, uh, add in as much lactic acid until it gets tart and see what you think. I didn't like it. It ta- talk, You know, we're talking about kettle sour and creating a unidimensional lactic character. <laughs> Th- this is like the epitome of unidimensional. It, it just tastes like you added lactic acid to beer. I mean, that, that's what you did. And if there are breweries out there doing that, I mean, come on. <laughs> you know, there, there are other approaches where you can get away with actually producing your own lactic acid uh, in, a, in a way that works better with that. That beer. That's my opinion. Now, the I'm so glad you brought up these these yeast strains that have the capacity to produce whatever acid it is. I do think it's lactic acid, but yeah, I've had a few. I've never used those yeast strains, but I've had people send me uh, you know multiple beers fermented with Philly sour or sour VCA. There, uh, my experience with those beers is that th- they are more tart than a regular beer. They are by no means. The, as tart as like a sour beer that 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 most people I think expect. Uh, it, it's not going to get you down into that three six to three eight pH range. Uh, at least that's not what it tastes like to me. But hey, I think it's an I think it's a really cool product. Uh, you know, to have available to us to use. Uh, I'm actually going to um, challenge you on that. Uh, and I've never used one, either one, but I believe I recall reading that they can actually go crazy low, like two point seven pH. Um, and you know, sour. Kettle sour, you know, broad term there, kettle sour beer. Quick sour beers typically are in that like kind of three two to three 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 four range, um, and so these can go really low. And so there's a few ways that people modulate that effect. Uh, it could be blending uh, finished beer. It could be blending in a non souring yeast strain like flagship or something like that to to mitigate the amount of acid that's produced and i think there's also a function of um sugar content and solution and maybe oxygen so there's definitely a lot of levers that you can pull and so what you've experienced are good brewers that know what they're doing and are making sure they're not going like below three because that's just unpalatable oh you can't drink that (laughs) yeah that would hurt uh yeah and that could be it i mean i'm not the one who made these beers they're just i think it's about four or five that people have sent me uh fermented with either of those two strains and they just haven't been 
It, again, those ones that I've tried just haven't been as tart or acidic as the kettle sour beers that I've had, you know, or, or even traditionally soured beers. Uh, but they're such an awesome, uh, you know, I think just product to have available. Again, like I said, so those are our experiences with these various quick souring methods. Even though for some of them we haven't had too much experience using them. Uh, when we come back, we're going to shift our focus to the various microbes that we've used when making these fast turnaround sours. We'll be right back. Family-owned Atlantic Brew Supply is the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award-winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus Atlantic Brew Supply has an on-site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two-day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code. Code BrewPod. That's B R U P O D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com and be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. In the original days of sour beer, when it was likely viewed as just beer, brewers relied on environmental microbes to inoculate their wort, and it usually took a good amount of time for whatever got in there to propagate and do their intended work. Uh, While some modern brewers still prefer this kind of old-fashioned approach, which I think is awesome, uh, we're fortunate enough these days to have many sources of souring bacteria at our disposal. Jordan, I was thinking we should start by giving a little primer on the souring microbes most commonly associated with quick sours. Uh, That way, folks who may not be familiar with sour Sour beer brewing have at least some idea of what we're talking about. Sure. Well, um, first, I guess, is just adding lactic acid. <laughs> but moving beyond <laughs> that, um, it, the primary source is lactobacillus. And so uh, we talked about that could come from the grains. It can come from a laboratory culture. Um, but lactic acid via lactobacillus is definitely the primary source of acidity in most quick sour beers. Now, I, I would contend, based on my research, I do not consider myself anywhere near an expert on sour beer. I mean, I, everything I learned, I learned from Michael Tonsmeyer and Milk the Funk, right? That, I give them all the credit. But my understanding is that the primary source of acidity in general, even in traditionally sour beer, is likely lactobacillus. It's just that in traditionally soured beers, there are other bacteria and yeast, microbes as it were, uh, that are also contributing uh, you know, some character as well. For example, Pediococcus and Acetobacter. Uh, Pediococcus, what, how does that differ? I mean, I, I don't know, but how does that differ from lactobacillus other than being a different bacteria uh, in terms of the characteristic that it imparts to beer? Uh, great question. So it definitely looks different under a microscope and it's a fundamentally different, you know, species of bacteria. And, uh, generally speaking, uh, I believe that PDO can take longer to work its magic. And there's an exception to that, which we'll talk about in a second, but most, uh, strains of PDO, uh, tend to take longer. And in fact, um, can even make the beer what they call ropey or sick. Yeah where the beer starts to turn like thick and have these like stringy strands of like proteins or something. I've never seen it happen. Um, but they say that, uh, if a beer gets sick, uh, it's going to be a good beer because once it, um, you know, resolves that they, they, they claim that that is a good sign for a really complex beer. And so the pediococcus can actually, uh, is blamed for a lot of the complexity or prized, I guess, for that matter, for the complexity that it brings to a mixed fermentation beverage. But it's tricky, right? Because PDO takes a long time, so they're uh, generally speaking, so you need to be prepared for the long run. Secondly, it can produce diacetyl. So, uh, and it can also get ropey. And so that's where Britannomyces comes in, which is a, quote, wild yeast strain, uh, which has a lot more, uh, I guess, one man's off flavor is another man's, you know, gold. And so the funky weird flavors that Britannomyces creates could be off-putting in a pilsner but it's part of that complexity you get in a mixed fermentation beer uh 
and Britannomyces is really important when you have Pediococcus present because of its ropiness that can create and its uh, uh, diastole that can create. Britannomyces can actually uh, break those down and convert them, you know, right. biotransform them, dare I say, uh, into ultimately positive flavors. And so uh, one of those, um, and forgive me for not knowing the exact terminology here, uh, I think it converts it to like ethyl butyrate or something like that. And it can convert basically a gross flavor that PDO creates. Brett can turn that into like a pineapple flavor. And so there's this kind of uh, symbiotic relationship with all these various organisms that um, that's why in quick souring, we just lean on the lacto. It, it provides the acidity without all that other baggage that gets in the way that we need time and other microbes uh, to work on. Yeah. So all of that information that you just shared is a part of the reason I think some people just will always prefer the traditional souring approach. When you're making a quick sour beer, you're not looking at Pediococcus. It takes way too long to do its thing. Uh, you, I've had friends who who ferment quick sour beers with Britannomyces, and they're phenomenal. It, it works really, really well. But that complexity that you get from Britannomyces working on the Pediococcus and or in tandem with these other microbes and stuff, you just can't get that with it in a quick sour beer. That's not the aim of quick sour beers. Uh, but that, but the, the, I think it's interesting interesting at least to break those down. Um, you know, again, we mentioned Acetobacter, one of the, one of the main, uh, flavor components of Flemish red ale is, or Flanders red ale as it were, is, is this kind of, you know, vinegar type character. I don't like the overly vinegar ones, but a little hint really does seem to accentuate the complexity of that style of beer. You're just not going to get that. <laughs> if you're doing quick souring properly, you're not going to get that in a quick sour beer. So those are those are some of the things. When we're talking about quick sour beers, we are talking almost solely about lactobacillus. Yeah. And then the exceptions there would be the souring yeast strains uh, that we talked about, Philly Sour, Sour Vicia, there might be another one or two out there, uh, or adding lactobacillus. But there is one other cool option, which bootleg biology has something called Sour Weapon P, and it's a quick souring pediococcus strain. And I used it one time, and it was fantastic. So they discovered this pedio strain that actually behaves like the lacto, uh, quick souring lacto strains that we're familiar with um, historically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's I think that's awesome. Well, let's let's when we so we have available to us it just so many options for souring bacteria. It's incredible. And the fact that there are so many yeast labs out there now that are producing these different bacteria for us to use just makes it so easy and approachable. I love it. Before we get into some of the more, I'm going to put this in air quotes, natural souring approaches. Let's talk about some lab cultures and we can even break down some of what the specific labs out there are offering. My understanding is that the two most common lactobacillus, I don't know if they're called strains or versions or whatever, but the, the two most common types of lactobacillus that, that brewers are using for souring are Delbrookii and Brevis. Uh, actually, I think Plantarum is the most popular. So my, my now I, is plantarum back in the day <laughs> plantarum was talked about as being one of the one of the main components of say probiotics which we're going to get to that in a minute whereas uh delbrookii and brevis were you, the ones that we were purchasing for use from labs are they now integrating plantarum into that i, I haven't seen it but i imagine that mm, that's probably the mm -hmm. case that's a good that's a good question i think that you're right historically delbrookii and brevis were the most popular ones but once people started discovering you know, good belly works yeah, really well. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I, there are there are definitely um, professional laboratory grade cultures of that available now for brewers. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, let, let let's just t talk about Delbrookii and Brevis here for a minute, then, because that's where my mind goes to when I think of like you know going to bootleg or 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 even you know picking up sour batch kids from Imperial or something like that. We're looking at Delbrookii and Brevis. In fact, I believe Imperial has a lacto Brevis you know strain. That that's just what they're using. Uh, my understanding is that Delbrookii lacto lacto Bacillus delbrookii uh, produces moderate levels of what what could be defined as a clean lactic acidity, um, and it's and it's pretty quick to work. Uh, by pretty quick, I've had you know experience with delbrookii taking you know two to three days uh, to to properly sour a beer before I you know I move on and I boil that wort and 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 ferment it. Um, have you experienced? Have you used delbrookii at all on its own? You know I don't know if I have used that one actually. Okay, so so I I've done it I think two times that I can recall maybe even more than that, um, and it's it's been it's always worked out. It seems to take a little bit longer than some of the other stuff we're going to talk about here in a minute. Lately, 
Uh, Lactobacillus brevis seems to be getting a little bit more attention, um, not nearly as much as plantarum. That that's coming up soon as well. Um, but I I don't know. I've never done a comparison. I would actually really be interested to mm. see a Delbruckii versus brevis comparison uh, when everything else is kept exactly the same because there there does seem to be some talk about preference and such online. Um, you know, brevis produces more acidity than Delbruckii. At least that's the claim. And I think a lot of people making quick sours, that's kind of what they're after is quicker and more acidity. Um, And it can also be a little bit more complex that that lactic acidity can be a little bit more complex uh, you know, not not quite as much as a traditional sour, of course, but but it does add a little bit more than just the lactic acidity that you're getting purportedly from Delbrucki. I think that's interesting. So I just made a sour beer with Brevis, a uh, kettle sour or batch sour, I guess, using the terminology from the last segment, <laughs> um, using Brevis. And uh, I held it at 100 degrees Fahrenheit and the dang thing would not drop below four. Huh. So I pre-acidified to four or five. Uh, and then, you know, day by day, it'd lose a point, you know, lose a point or point one or whatever. And it just stalled at four. And looking up online, you know, and, and talking with some other people, uh, hearing wildly different uh, experiences, my pro brewer buddy in town had just made a sour beer with the same exact like branded culture. And theirs went down to three, three, no problem. Um, and then a home brewer buddy uh, also couldn't get it to go too much lower. And I recall Cade uh, in an experiment, uh, his didn't go below four at all, but he only let it go for a day. So uh it seems that there are varying experiences that people are having with Brevis. And um, it, at the very least, it does not seem to be as fast as maybe some of the other strains. And maybe uh, in some circumstances can struggle to go too low, which in some ways can be a good thing. Because what I was fascinated by after fermentation, it actually dropped another 0.4 points or something to 3.6 or something like that. And so, you know, maybe using some acidic fruits, etc., you can continue to dial the... Um, pH down yeah. for a guy like me that doesn't want a you know dentist visit justifying sour beer. <laughs> uh, I actually kind of like how Brevis is a little more can be a lighter touch. Yeah, and it had a really interesting complex flavor. I should say that too. Yeah, I've had Brevis beers. I've I think I've only made one or two with straight lacto Brevis. Usually, I'm doing some sort of a blend, so I don't really know exactly what is going on there. But um, it, it my experience there's a lot of you know, pros to using lab cultures that you, you can trust their purity. They're easy to pitch, very replicable, or maybe I shouldn't put very on there, but you know, more replicable than some of these other approaches. But the, the one thing that I've noticed, regardless of whether I'm doing traditional or quick souring is they just seem to take longer, uh, to, to, to do their work. And I don't, I don't get that because I would think that, you know, Compared to some other natural or or weird, uh, if you will, approach to to adding you know souring uh, bacteria to, I would think that a lab culture would be the quickest you know uh, and most efficient. But really, that's not been my experience. It, it works great. You just got to give it a little bit more time. Uh, another approach that I've used quite a bit actually, and I think <laughs> I think I like it because it does. It, it's kind of unpredictable. You don't really know what's going to end up in the end, but I kind of like that. And I've always enjoyed what I've gotten is just by souring, by adding unmilled barley malt uh, to your wort. Um, It's kind of an old school, simple technique for doing that. It has worked for me every single time I've done it. That is not the case for everybody. I've heard some horror stories, but uh, there is lactobacillus naturally present on malt. And so by adding that, your your lactobacillus is the bacteria, of course, you're adding those bacteria to that wort and they do the same thing that any other lactobacillus would do. It works incredibly well. Have you ever tried it, Jordan? Well, I mean, that's effectively sour mashing, but um, I have done that to make sour gut at home. Oh, and, yeah. Oh, my gosh. It makes the best sour gut. You know, I've, I've had it go wrong, actually, where there was oxygen that was exposed and it like was like gray and disgusting. Ugh. So uh, it definitely can turn sour, uh, pun intended. But it is a, you can make some really pure and complex, incredible tasting stuff using that method. Do, so obviously it's not just lactobacillus that's going to be on the the barley malt. There's going to be other stuff. And I think that's a part of why I really like this method. It it feels like a good blend of like old school thought with modern approach. Right. And you, and you know, every beer that I've made using this, this method, just adding barley malt has come out, 
having some unique characteristics that I enjoy. Sometimes they're really doughy. I mean, it tastes almost like bread dough. Other times you get more of that lactic, like a lemony lactic acidity that, that it really is almost like lemonade. Just delicious. But it, it, for me, it's worked out every time. I have a good friend, Derek Springer, uh, who who used to blog at fivebladesbrewing.com. Uh, uh, he he has a whole write-up about doing this approach where he actually pre-sours some wort to make sure that with, with grains to make sure that that's all good. That it propagates the lactobacillus and then he adds that to his wort only if it tastes good. Apparently, he's had some bad experiences and that's why mm-hmm. he developed that method. I have not. I literally just take a, maybe a cup full, maybe two cups or so of unmilled pale or pilsner malt, put it in a sanitized uh, like hop bag and toss that in the wort and then I set it to 100 degrees Fahrenheit Fahrenheit, 38 degrees C, and I leave it until it develops the acidity that I like. It does take three-ish days, three or four days in my experience to get it to where I like it, but I'm telling you, the complexity from this very, very simple method is always just astounding to me. I've always enjoyed what I, what I get using this method. Yeah, it's a good one. Um, well, speaking of adding like non-laboratory sources of uh, lactobacillus, I think that we... we Cannot finish this podcast without mentioning Good Belly. We have to talk about Good Belly. Uh, if anybody doesn't know what Good Belly is, you can go to your local grocery store and pick some up. It is just a probiotic yogurt shake type of thing. And honestly, it tastes quite delicious. They have different flavors. They've got like blueberry, but they also have plain. Uh, I've I've actually used mango. I believe it was mango Good Belly and blueberry Good Belly. And you, in my, you use so little of this stuff before we get into how to use it. If you only have available to you the fruited versions of Good Belly, uh, it that fruit does not seem to have any impact whatsoever on the flavor of the finished beer. I just don't think there's enough in the amount of Good Belly you're actually adding to contribute like that a mango or blueberry flavor to the beer. Uh, what is it about Good Belly that makes it possible to to, to use for making quick sour beers? Uh, it is rife with lactoplantarum, which turns out to be a r- exceptional kettle sour uh, ingredient. You know, when held at the proper temperature, and people are even saying at room temp it can even work. Um, it just it works and it acidifies and it's clean um, and it seems to be fairly low risk. You know, not a lot of people were reporting off flavors, etc. Um, I, I think that I've heard that mango is allegedly the most neutral of the fruited ones, and that you might get a little bit of uh, flavor. But who doesn't want a little hint of blueberry in their sour beer? I mean, I'm not complaining, right? The the ones that I've made, uh, I've only done I've done one of each, one with blueberry, one with mango, and uh, I'm telling you, I I have a little a place in my heart for the just tossing grains in because I feel like that's so it's so uh, rudimentary. Man, the Good Belly uh, soured sour beers that I have had are have all been phenomenal. They have this beautiful acidity that that it just shocks me that a little bit of yogurt did that um it's it's really a great so and also when you're done you know using what you're going to use for your beer you can just drink the rest of the stuff you don't have to waste it and it tastes really good there are other probiotics that people use as well uh, one of them is called, I think it's called Yakult or something like that. Um, they're, they come in, my kids drink them all the time. They're like these little probiotic drinks that's like one sippers. Um, but those also have a blend of uh, of different bacteria, including lactobacillus. Pretty much anything. I was doing some reading on the Sui Generi blog. Uh, pretty much any probiotic will work to sour wort. Um, you, what you want to look for specifically though is lactobacillus plantarum and or, I'm going to say this wrong probably, but lactobacillus rhamnosus. Um, I believe both of those will, uh, you know, basically... Uh, do the same thing that a, that a you know a lab grade lactobacillus would do, and it does it in no time flat. I mean, it is so fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you got to be careful too. You really want to monitor your pH because it can go yeah. too far. Um, it really works, but it's a great thing. And there are other products as well from Good Belly. Like I think they have pills. And I think they have little shots. Like they kind of look like five hour energy drinks. I think I've never yeah. used those. Um, I've always used the carton, and it's like a, uh, a the tall milk carton. You know, like the half. What what size is that? Is that a What's that, a half gallon, something? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Maybe something like that. <laughs> um, and I've done half, um, and I've done the whole thing, and, and either way is fine. So I, the last few times I used it, I just did the whole thing just to get rid of it because I don't really want to drink it. Um, I think Swanson's might make a pill that's popular, um, but there's a lot of sources of plantarium out there. But I swear that home brewers have you know, kept Good Belly in business. Like, no joke. Who's, who's, I've never heard of a 
human drinking this for fun. Like I've, <laughs> I, I, it's in the grocery store though. At least it is here. So, and I know that they've even had like reps like talk to Milk the Funk, and so they definitely know it's being used by home brewers. Um, there are some pro brewers that use it, but I think that at the pro scale, it might get a bit spendy. Yeah, and yeah. a uh, lab sourced thing is just going to be more cost effective and, and theoretically more um, consistent and re- and uh, you know f- food fermentation grade reliable, etc. But for home brewers, you know, Good Belly is really kind of like the home brewing industry standard at this point for quick sour making. Yeah, Good Belly. Uh, I know Malcolm, he has a preferred women's probiotic pill that he uses and he opens up something like six of the capsules. Those aren't cheap. That's Good Belly's cheap. I mean, on the homebrew scale. Uh, I think I paid $3 for, I think it's a quarter gallon actually, uh, but you, you pay like three bucks for a quarter gallon jug of this stuff and, and that's it. You know, you, you're off to the races. If somebody's asking me, hey, I want to make my first sour beer. I don't want it to take a long time. My recommendation, Good Belly. Without a doubt, because you're going to yeah. you're going to get you're going to get predictable results very, very quickly. So it's you, you, you don't have to be terribly patient. Um, I think there's value in everybody trying their hand at, at, at least one traditional sour. It's kind of fun, um, you know, long term project. But I'm telling you, these good belly beers are phenomenal. There are certain things that you want to avoid. If you're you don't have to go with good belly. This is not a paid you know episode <laughs> for good belly, though. We would be happy to take their sponsorship money. Uh, it, but good belly just happens to be what most of of the brewers that we're aware of jordan uh, have kind of fallen on and that and it works phenomenally well there are other sources of these uh, same lactobacilli lactobacilli um in different forms as well there are other shakes that have this there are pills and stuff like that in all of those you're getting more than just the lactobacillus though um things that you don't want to be in your probiotic or yogurt uh are things like enteriococcus i think it's called facium uh this stuff will has the (laughs) ability to end up making your beer smell like death and uh defecation <laughs> mm-hmm, um, and, mm-hmm. it, and it can actually uh, create allergens uh, that, that for, for some people as well. So if you're seeing that it has enterococcus facium, uh, you want to avoid that. There are uh, certain uh, probiotics that have clostridium in them that produces butyric acid, which Jordan, what does that taste like? Is that, was that, uh, is that, B- baby vomit or which one is that baby vomit yeah cheesy baby puke type of thing yeah it's nasty i've actually smelled a uh, flavor standard of butyric acid there's no way i would put that in my mouth uh it is disgusting and then finally you want to avoid anything that's uh, bacillus aureus clausii or pumulus um because those both produce or all three of those produce diacetyl so those are just things you want to keep in mind if you just go with good belly which this stuff is everywhere you're not going to have any issues whatsoever you don't need that much. It's cheap and it tastes good. I think it tastes good even, uh, you know, drinking your leftovers. But um, yeah, those are kind of the, the main sources, I think, for probiotics. You're looking at Good Belly, Yakult. Um, I've heard of people just using regular yogurt, like plain mm-hmm. yogurt, and that works Nancy's. really well for them. What, what's it called? Nancy's. And I believe that's made in Springfield, Oregon. Um, that That's one that I think people have a lot of success with. And, and like straight up adding a vat of yogurt from the grocery store into your beer. It's so weird. I've never done that. Um, and I know that there are even some pro brewers left that are still using actual yogurt for yeah. their kettle, kettle souring. I'll, I've never done it either, but I've had I've had beers that were uh, soured with yogurt. Phenomenal, I'm telling you. I mean, I like sour beer, so I'm I, and I like it, that's one of the that, that category of sour beer is one where I love uniqueness. I love the differences that I get from a different sour beer or or a different brewer, you know, using a different approach. Um, so try these out. I mean, don't my, my recommendation that that's kind of it for I think the souring bacteria. Was there anything else you wanted to add, Jordan? No, I think we covered them. Yeah, I think I think that's all of them. Uh, you know, at least that we've used that we have experience with. My recommendation in the end is don't be afraid to make sour beer. It's so easy. Yeah, you may get a little bit of hate from the traditionalists out there, but who cares? This is brewing. And if you like a lot of the sour beers that you've had at local pubs, chances are a good majority of those, I could be wrong, but we're quick soured. And you can do that at home. It's not very difficult at all. Um, it's a lot of fun. And that one of the benefits is it only takes you about an hour to create some wort. 
So you're only spending an hour on day one. You toss your stuff in, you know, your, your lactic acid bacteria, and then you wait a couple of days. And then all you're doing is going out and doing a quick boil. I've done like 15 minute boils where I'm just adding, you know, one or two pellets of hops to like a Berliner Weisse style beer. Uh, you bring that back down, chill it, and you ferment it like normal. It's a very, very easy style to make. So that is about all the time we've got for this episode. Do you have any final words you'd like to leave our listeners with, Jordan? Yeah, keep making great sour beers. There's so many new ways to do it, and uh, the exploration will never end. Yeah, amen to that. Uh, well, don't forget to check out our podcast, The Brew Lab, where host Kate Job takes you into the lab with brewing experts to discuss the fascinating research they're doing on our favorite beverage. And remember to head over to brewlosophy.com to stay current on everything we're up to. The Brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it soothes my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown.